I've been blessed. You better believe I have been. I have been blessed. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with me this morning, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 1. Church at Corinth, did it ever have its problems? 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse 1. The apostle said, it is, not ex it is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Father, I pray now that you'd bless this holy word as it goes forth for those who hear it. Father, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. The word is quick. It's alive, my Father. And I pray, Lord, that you'd anoint it and use it for your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. This is one of those classic passages in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 12. If you've ever read through the Bible, when you got to the, second, uh, when you got to the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, you probably parked here for a little while and asked the Holy Ghost to, uh, to give you what you needed from the Scripture because it's loaded. What you read is about a man who left his body, but he wasn't sure whether he was in his body or not in his body because he had a body. And the body the apostle talks about is in 2 Corinthians 5, where it says that we would not be clothed upon or not clothed upon. In other words, a spirit out here with no body. For the Lord hath given us a body. This body that the saint of God has at the moment that they leave this flesh is a body that God made for you to stay in till he comes and brings up a glorified body from the ground to meet your soul and spirit in the air when you're complete with God. He doesn't want you just as an ethereal spirit out here floating around somewhere. He wants you to be substantial and to have an anchor and to have an identity. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell, but he said, I know this. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven. Now, when I say I, the apostle Paul says, I knew a man in Christ. He's speaking about himself, but he's using it in a way for you to understand that it's not Paul doing any bragging here, that he knows that he were he was, and he simply wants you to understand that something profound happened to him. And that's what I'm going to preach about this morning, what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. If you'll notice what it says in verse number 4, how that he was caught up into paradise, and notice carefully, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. I'm going to call your attention to the unspeakable and the lawful. The unspeakable is translated from the Greek word aritos. And that word means it cannot be expressed by human power. It cannot be expressed by human power. So what he heard was absolutely beyond human comprehension. Yet it blew him away. For the Bible says in verse number 4, it is not lawful for a man to utter. That word lawful is exorcistan, and it means without approval. God does not allow it to be said. 
In plain words, there are things that are said in heaven that you do not need to hear. You say, why not, preacher? Because you wouldn't stay here any longer. The idea here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 is that what the apostle heard was so wonderful, so beyond human comprehension, so above our ability to understand, that if we even got a little glimpse of it, just a little taste of it, that we'd all go out and leave the world this afternoon. Because the apostle said that I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things the Lord has in store for those that love him. That's a quotation from the book of Isaiah, chapter number 64. The apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians, he said, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far greater. Now the reason he said that is because he had been called up into the third heaven. Here's a man not speaking from what he'd heard. Here's a man speaking from what he knew. First hand, he'd been there. And the reason I suppose that God gave us this is because of this earthly tabernacle and this earthly sojourn and this house that we live in and this place that we are, that we are part of is truly a veil of tears. There's a lot of suffering and a lot of sorrow and a lot of pain and a lot of woe and there's an awful lot of separation of loved ones that are dear and near to our heart and to our soul. Sometime in this lifetime, it might have happened to you recently and it may happen to you soon. It might have happened to you some time ago. I remember 1969 when I walked out of the University of Tennessee Hospital. I think it was about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning somewhere in there. They had just told me that my grandfather had expired. The one that was the nearest to me on the face of this earth. The one that I loved more than anybody else on this earth at that time in 1969 was the man who had raised me, who was the man who was all the father that I ever knew, who was the man that took me into his home. And that was my, is all I ever knew to be a father. And he had just passed away. I can't explain to you the hurt that I felt, but I felt it deep down inside my soul. And to this very day in 2017, I still feel the loss of my grandfather who passed away in 1969. My dear friend, if you've ever suffered the loss of a loved one, you understand what I'm talking about today. If you've ever walked away from a fresh-made grave, out there in the graveyard somewhere, we are within a stone's throw of one, then there are grave sites out there with flowers on them and tombstones. And there are many tombstones out there that have little lambs on top of the tombstone. These are for the little babies. You'd be surprised at how many little children are buried out here in this graveyard. But let me tell you what's really buried out there in that graveyard. Would you like to know? Would you like to know what's really out there in that graveyard? Let me explain it to you very simply. There's an awful lot of hearts buried out there in that graveyard. I'm talking about people who buried someone that they loved dearly, that was near and dear to their soul, that they loved and they lived for, and their body is buried out there in that graveyard. A lot of memories are buried out there in that graveyard of a life that had been lived, of someone that had been loved, of someone that is missed. Not too long ago, I came down this road over here that comes by the graveyard, and there sat a man next to a tombstone. And I passed there time and time again, and I don't know how many times I've seen that man sitting next to that tombstone, just sitting there. He's got his little chair sitting there, and there's the tombstone, the flowers that he brought to the gravesite. There he sits. He sits there and probably is talking to his wife because that's his wife that he's buried there, and he's talking to her, and he remembers that the life that they lived together, and no doubt his heart breaks. No doubt there's a pain that's deep, deep down inside his soul, my dear friend. If it were not for the voice of the Son of God, the Bible says that all the dead that in the grave shall hear his voice one day and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. He is Lord and master of the graveyard too, my dear friend. If he cannot raise the dead, then he cannot save your soul. Amen. Some of the young people, they get cocky, they get smart alecky, they get wise. It's because they never lost anything. It's because they don't have anything invested. It's because they don't have any blood, sweat, and tears in this world. It's because they don't have any experience. It's because they don't really know what life is about. Wait until you've been through that a few times. Wait until your heart has been broken a few times. 
Wait until you bled and suffered and died. And just then you might begin to get a hold of what life is about. Life's not easy. Life's hard. Life can throw you a curveball. Life can create all kinds of problems for you. But I'm glad this morning, thank God, that I know him that liveth forever and ever and ever. Amen. So God put this in the Bible. He put this in the scripture to comfort us. He put this in the Bible to illuminate us. He put this in the Bible to teach us. He put this in the scripture so that we might have hope. We don't live here alone. You might listen to the atheists and the agnostics that says, oh, we're just here alone. We're like dogs. We live out our lives and we die. So here's what you're telling me, atheist. Here's what you're telling me, agnostic. You're telling me that we have no reason whatsoever for our existence. There's nothing going on. We're just a bunch of dogs and cats scratching and clawing to exist and to survive from one day to the next. And then I say back to you, what's the point? What's it about? If that's all there is. But oh no, my Bible says God reached down and took the dust of the ground. He breathed into that dust the breath of life. And that dust became a living soul. Amen. And Abraham stood before him and said, Lord, you know that I'm just dust to the ground. Abraham understood his essence. He understood where he came from. But he also understood where he was going. For he said, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right. Amen. So here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 he said he heard words that were inexpressible that cannot be expressed what did he hear maybe he heard the voice of a mother embracing a baby that she'd carried out to the graveyard and buried his little body beneath the ground we buried one over here about 20 30 30 something years ago a beautiful little baby about that big i remember to this very day it's a little casket little white casket about that long carried it over here to the graveyard the one on the other side of the road over there i think's greenwood and this woman from to this very day she weeps over that little child maybe just maybe he heard that he heard the mothers and the little daughters and the little sons as they united together again maybe he heard the husbands and the wives that had been separated as they joined together again and the shouting in glory maybe he heard that one that had been suffering all of his life the mother the father the son the daughter the husband of the wife all they'd ever known in this world was suffering some folks are like that you know folks some folks can't play ball games some co folks can't run they can't jump they hurt and they've hurt all of their life maybe he just heard when they walk into the gates of glory and for the first time there's no more pain in their body they never heard again can you imagine the kind of shouting and glory and praise to God for a soul that has been made free from a body that suffers with pain and sorrow that my dear friend is just a little bit he possibly heard in heaven maybe he heard the singing what if he heard the singing of the saints of God and of the angels? What a song that could have been. Can you imagine as he heard the song of the millions and millions and millions of the redeemed? Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to sing with that crowd one day. I'm going to stand up there in heaven. I'm going to stand toe to toe, shoulder to shoulder. And I'm going to sing about being redeemed. Every last one of us was raised raised up from some hell hole into the king's palace sing for the glory of God I don't know what they heard maybe they heard the cherubim and the seraphim maybe they heard the angels maybe they heard the glory of God so powerful as it swept across the gates of glory one day dear friend if you live long enough if the Lord Jesus doesn't come back before in the next few years you'll go the way of all the earth you'll go the way of the flesh the thing that is most definite about your life on this earth, you're going to die. I know Satan's got you convinced that you'll live forever. I know he's got you convinced that there is no, there's no, nothing to worry about. You've got all this life. You're going to, you're a young person. You're never going to die. But I'm going to tell you something. Young people die. Old people die. 
Sick people die, well people die. Death stalks every one of us. He's called the grim reaper. We don't know from one day to the next if we're going to be here tomorrow. But there's one thing I know for certain. It doesn't matter if tomorrow comes. Christ is going to come again. And I know whom I have believed. Amen. Hallelujah to God. The apostle said in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, I have not seen. The third heaven, he said, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 10 and verse number 14. Your Bible says this, Deuteronomy 10, 14. The scripture says, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. Boy, I can't imagine what heaven's going to be like, but I do know this. I do know that I am much closer to heaven now than I was just a few years ago. And I know that the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. I have a building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know that I've passed from death into life. I know that I'm not what I used to be. I know in whom I have believed. I know these things today and nobody can take them away from me. Heaven is as surely my home as I stand before you this morning and open the Bible and preach the word of God. Here's the second thing I want you to see. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now that apostle says that this earth's suffering and sorrow is a light affliction. You say, preacher, he didn't understand how I've suffered. What kind of mockery is that? That's not mockery. Let me tell you why it's not mockery. Because he takes the suffering of this world and he compares it to the glory of Christ. He takes the temporal life on this earth and he compares it to eternity and glory. I want you to understand there's not a one of us in this house today that can get a full grasp of what the Bible talks about in eternity. But I want you to know that your little short life and my little short life has been 70 years, but it's passed like a vapor. My little 70 years on this earth, I can't believe how quickly I got to this age. And some of you think, well, I got all this time in front of me. Wake up, you'll be where I am before you know it. And there are those in our house today that are over their 90s. And I'd say they'd say the same thing to you. That it just turn around once or twice and I'm 90 years old. What happened to my lifetime? It just fleeting. And that's what the Bible said. What is your life but a vapor? It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. That is this life. The apostle Paul said this though. He said that our light affliction, which is but for a moment. So you say, preacher, are you telling me that chemotherapy and dialysis and surgery and joint replacement and oxygen canisters, and wheelchairs, and crutches, and cancer, and heart failure, and all of the other maladies that fall befall the human flesh are light afflictions? Yes. And here's why I say it. Because it's just here now, and it'll be over with soon. It's just for a little while. Because compare that with the glory that shall be revealed. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter said it this way. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Peter said it this way, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. I'm going to see his glory. Peter said it again. He said, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Both the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter said, there is a glory that shall be revealed. 
Glory, glory, glory. Now, if you've got the Holy Ghost today, and if you're born again, you do. If you're truly born again by the grace of God, you've got glory in your soul. I've heard Ed Ballou sing that song time and again. I want to die on the battlefield with glory in my soul. That glory in your soul is not a made-up thing. It's not a fabrication. It's a reality. If you've ever had the Holy Ghost move in your heart, you know what I'm talking about today with the glory of God. There is glory in my soul. There are times in my soul when I rejoice that there's nothing around me to rejoice about. There are times in my soul that I'm singing when all around me is nothing but death. You don't live by external. You don't live by being pumped up from the outside. You've got a well inside you that will never run dry. You've got a spring springing up inside you that is the life eternal. You've got the power of God living down inside your soul. And nothing can change that if you have the glory that I'm talking about today. I don't have to tell you there is something inside you that causes calls for heaven, that yearns for Christ, that reaches beyond this veil of tears and rolls back that scroll and you can see into the heaven of heavens that he talks about in Deuteronomy. Yes, sir! I was not made and I was not saved for this world. I came from above for the glory that's inside me did not originate here. It originated in the very presence and power of Almighty God. The apostle said that this glory shall be revealed. The first thing that I think about of the glory being revealed is the beauty of the Son of God. The eyes as a flame of fire, the hair white as snow, the feet as, as fine brass, and as they took him to the top of the mountain of transfiguration, his whole countenance shining more brilliant than the sun itself. In the book of Revelation, an angel appears to John. That angel begins to give the apostle John revelations of the future. The Bible says that John, the apostle John, who knew the Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on this earth, fell down at the feet of that angel because that angel was so beautiful and so brilliant. And what that angel does, the angel said, get up now, I'm of your fellow servants, the prophets. He wouldn't let him worship him. But John was literally blown away with the beauty of glory. And you would be too. You would be too. You would be too. That glory shall be revealed. Can you imagine a land of singing? A land of no pain. A land of no sorrow. That it talks about in Revelation chapter number 21. He talks about in Revelation. He said, there is no pain. There is no sorrow. There is no, none of this anymore. The former things are passed away. The tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall be their God. And listen, it all started with God's tabernacle with men. It all started with God walking with men. It all started with God communing with a man like he could not commune with an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim. But he could commune with a man. They could interchange communication, thoughts and ideas. And that man praised his God. But sin separated the two of them. And then the Bible says the Lord Jesus took that sin away as the scapegoat and the tabernacle of God will once again be with men. How he looks forward to that day and how I do too. Amen. To live with him forever. To enjoy him forever. That Bible said in the book of Colossians that all things were made by him, Christ, and for him, Christ. That meant that I was made for him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Well, isn't God blessed with the creation? I mean, he's got this beautiful earth floating around out here in the midst of nowhere. He's got the sun and the moon and the stars. He's got all this stuff out of that stuff. <laughs> that stuff. He can make that and say the word and it all comes to pass again. He can wipe this universe away in one move and create another one just like that. But you, he reached down and formed from the dust of the ground and breathed his very life into you and you became a living soul because he wants to talk to you, walk with you, commune with you. And he wants to have that tabernacle of God with men. And that's what Revelation's talking about. His tabernacle, his presence, his abiding presence is going to be with men. Do you know the thing I look for in heaven? And I know my day is coming, and I don't know when it is. Don't need to know when it is. I don't want to know. Don't you? Do you want to know when you're going to pass on? No. Good night, no. I mean, you can sit around. I got two days left. What am I going to do? 
you know. No, 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 no. I want to go when God gets ready for me to go. And I want to be doing what God wants me to be doing until he gets me. Amen. 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 Do what I can do until God comes to get me. And the Lord knows that, but I want you to know this. Buddy, when he does come to get me, I've got my mind what's set on where I'm going. It is set on things eternal. My mind is set on that which is above and not on the things on this earth. That's why I preach the way I do. Be fine with me if I dropped right here and went on to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's what he wants for me to do, then I'm ready to go. I've been through the emergency room, the IR, I don't know how many times, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. I quit counting after about eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Plugged up, get my heart, to, get my heart back in, in rhythm, laying over there in that emergency room, night after night after night after night. And I said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, if I go tonight, I'm ready to go. Will you take care of this little lady sitting right here next to me? That's all I worried about. Take care of my sweetheart. I'm ready to go. Now, if you've ever been to the point of death as many times as I have, you'd understand what my heart quit beating just a few months ago and stopped for five seconds. The cardiologist told me my heart was not beating and my head was going just like this. And you know what? It didn't scare me one bit because I'm ready to go. You ready to go? Are you ready to go? Are you really ready to go? The glory that shall be revealed. Then finally this. In Romans chapter number 8, verse 18, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. In other words, he said, it's not up to me to make a choice. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that all their lifetime they were subject to bondage because they feared death. The fear of death. The fear of death is a snare. Fear bringeth torment. Now, some of you will never admit it, but if you thought you were going to die in the next 30 minutes, you'd, your heart palpitations would start. You'd break out in a cold sweat, and you would really, you'd lose it. You'd lose it. A lot of people are like that. They're scared to death that they might die. I don't know how many times I've been around people, and, this, and I've seen them go into terrible physical conditions. And they're saying, oh, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me, God, help me. And I take them by the hand and I pray, God, help them, God, help them, God, help them. I'm just being observant. When you get ready to cross over that bar and leave this world and go to that next world, game time is over with, folks. You don't care who's in the room. You don't care what you're wearing. You don't care what's going on at home. It's you and God. You and God. You and God. And I've observed down through the years, these things happen to people. They happen. I remember when it first started with me. All this started four years ago. I couldn't breathe. I had to sit up in bed. Y'all remember that? I was in heart failure. I was in heart failure. Couldn't breathe. I know, what, I know, I know exactly what it's like. And I remember falling out of the bed. For the first time, I fell out of the bed, fell down on my knees in that bedroom. I fell down on my knees and I came face to face with the reality that I might die. And everything changed in my life. Now, you just live like you're going to live. And I just lived serving God and doing what I want. But I didn't really think much about dying until that day. And that day, when I fell on my knees in that bedroom, it just hit me with a ton of bricks. You might die, son. You know what I started doing right then and there and haven't stopped since then? Making sure, making really sure I'm ready. Making really sure that I'm ready. Why, well, preacher, you've preached all these. I, mean, that's, I asked a man the other day, I said, are you saved? He said, I'm a preacher. What the, what's that got to do with anything? 
That's not what I asked you. I didn't ask you if you're a preacher. I asked you if you've been saved. His reply to me should have been, oh, yes, I've been saved. Hallelujah. Thank God I've been saved. Because there's a lot of reverends standing in the pulpit right now that don't have a clue. They don't have a clue what it means to be born again. Now, if I ask you've been saved, don't tell me that you're a mechanic. <laughs> don't tell me that you're a preacher. Don't tell me that, you, that, that I drive a red car. If I ask you if you've been saved, tell me you've been saved. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. I remember when I brought Bill Wright up here back in the early 80s. You, many of you don't know Bill. Many of you do. That's the man that taught me Greek and Hebrew. He came from Pensacola Bible Institute down there in Florida. I sat in his class, and he taught me. But when he first came up here, he brought his father-in-law with him. And we met back here in the office. First meeting. Didn't know him. First meeting. His father-in-law said, uh, Preacher, he said, uh, Tell me about your conversion. <laughs> Just like that. And I could have gotten mad and stomped at the person. What do you mean my conversion? I'm the pastor of Temple Baptist Church. You don't ask me if I've been saved or not. That's what a lot of proud, arrogant people would have done. I looked at him in the eye and I said, oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where I came from and I'll tell you what God's done for me. And I sat in to give him my testimony. And I've preached that testimony to you I don't know how many times. I had somebody say to me not long ago, Preacher, I know what year you got saved. 1973. I said, you got it right. Another one said to him, Preacher, I know how old you were when you got saved. 27. You got that right. Preacher, I know where you were saved. In your brother-in-law's living room, sitting on the seat. That's right. You got it right. They've been listening to me. You know why? Because I've said it over and over and over and over and over again. I'm not ashamed of the one who saved me. So if I ask you if you're saved, don't tell me you're a preacher. I don't hear anything about your preaching. Tell me when you got saved. I'm afraid we got too many deceived. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Are you ready to die? In the book of Revelation, that new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. And here's what it says. It says... He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates to the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers, and whoremongers and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The worst thing to me about hell will be the memories. You'll remember that precious wife or that precious husband that prayed for you, or that mother that got down next to your bedside, or that daughter or that son got saved, came home, tried to tell you about it. The memories of the gospel messages that you rejected and the times you could be saved, the memories. And you'll know they're in there and you're outside. You don't want to do that. You don't want to be outside in eternity. You want to be in. Can I open the door for you this morning and tell you to come in? All can come. Whosoever will, let him come. And take of the water of life freely. You can, you're welcome. You're welcome. Come. Come to Christ. Come to him and be saved today. And you'll know that you know that you know that you're born again, and one day you'll grab that mother that prayed for you and read the Bible to you and is waiting on you in heaven. You'll grab her, say hallelujah to God. <laughs> we're here, we're here, we made it. <laughs> or you'll grab that wife or that husband so dear to you and take hold of them by the hand and say, now let's walk on into his presence. Or that little girl or that little boy that you buried out here, and they'll be waiting and jump into your arms. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, pray you'd bless your word now. I preached what you put on my heart, delivered my soul, burden's gone. In thy holy name we ask it, for Jesus' sake we pray, amen.